this is Shakespeare therapy, herbal healing or herbal healing if you're American. Um, we pronounce that word differently. There's an old joke called two countries that goes two countries separated by a common language. And this is a really good <laughs> example of that because they say herbs and we say herbs, but herbal healing is kind of difficult to say. Say it three times fast and you'll see what I mean. Anyway, I'm gonna have to probably strain to hear you, but I'm just gonna do our little intro first. I'm Garrett Quayley, author of Botanical Shakespeare. And this is Hannah Sylvester, who is the district herbalist. And Hannah, can you please tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about what you do and, and how you do it? <laughs> Sure. So um, my name is my name is Hannah Sylvester. I'm a I'm a medical herbalist, and I help people to to get better through the of medicinal plants. I see people for health consultations, and then I prescribe them bespoke blends of herbs after that. And I also take people out on nature walks as well, and help them to understand and to connect with um, growing plant life um a little more easy to help them to to see what's out there first we're going to talk about father's day just quickly and and a, and an herb that i uh am putting or a plant that i'm putting together with fathers and also herbs around midsummer we just had the new moon we just had a partial solar eclipse this is the summer solstice and normally that would be called midsummer but there's a little bit of a um there's a little bit of a, again, not quite congruency with when Midsummer is. So Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream probably was set on June 24th. That's when the day has been set. But because the moon is a, an ever-changing thing, as Juliet says, don't swear by the moon, the constant changing moon. Um, so it's the same way that Christmas was fixed on the December 25th, but Easter is always changing. Hanukkah is always changing. And Midsummer is traditionally pegged as June 24th, which interestingly is Robert Dudley's birthday as well. St. John's Day too, but Robert Dudley was Queen Elizabeth's favorite. And he was always trying to get her to marry him and all that kind of stuff. So that would be June 24th. However, it is also the solstice which is now. And Midsummer, a Midsummer Night's Dream supposedly takes place on Midsummer's Day. However, there's a weird line that Theseus says, um, saying, why, why were the, the lovers in the forest? And he says, because they were probably observing a rite of May. Well, Midsummer is not in May. So, and, and there's a lot of little weird time jumps in Shakespeare. There's a big one in Hamlet, which we can discuss. Oh, we will be discussing Hamlet a little bit because of the Father's Day thing. There's a line in Hamlet where Ophelia says, I hear some violets, but they withered. I had some violets for you, but they withered all when my father died. And not everybody's father is with them. And so it can be a little bit of a sad day. It was started in America, actually. Shakespeare mentions father, fathers more than 500 times and mothers about 75 times less. So uh, around the 400, 430 mark, if you will. And um, Father's Day and Mother's Day kind of were proposed at the same time, but Mother's Day was signed into to a proclamation, an official proclamation in 1914 by Woodrow Wilson, but he couldn't push it through. Uh, he couldn't push Father's Day through, and it didn't really happen until Lyndon Johnson in 1966 took it up again. And then um, it, it came to be an actual thing in the, during the Nixon administration. And so, as many things, uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day migrated over to England but the funny thing is Father's Day is on the same day in England and America, but it's not, Mother's Day is not. Mother's Day for us is in May. Mother's Day in Britain is in March around Lady Day, which was the New Year's Day. So there's a big chunk of something to remember to sharpen your brain. And um, so violets, 
uh, were thought of as the nodding violet because the stem isn't strong and it kind of droops. So the violet is thought of as modest and it's thought of kind of as a sad flower, which is why Ophelia is talking about it of, as far as Polonius, who's, who's just died. And my father is very much with us, which I'm very grateful for. But a friend of mine's father just died a couple of weeks ago, and I was extremely fond of him. So the Father's Day thing isn't always just for your own father, but father figures, other people's fathers, people who have had a fatherly influence on you. Uh, we celebrate all of those. And so for those that, that aren't still present, um, we're going to talk about violets. And Hannah, can you I can see you're buffering a little bit, but I hope you can still hear me. Can you talk about the any healing properties or uses of violet as an herb? I know they're edible. So um, violets are, are really very, very cooling and very moist. And we use the both the, the leaves and the flowers actually um, within medicine. So the kind of places where we where we might use violets are for body conditions that are really hot and really dry. So things like um, heartburn, when your digestion is really, really aggravated and agitated, and skin conditions that are really hot and dry, like eczema. Well, oh, that's useful and lovely. <laughs> um, great. So there's some use for violets. If you have some, you can forage, or you find some at your florist, or you want to grow some on your own. Um, so there we have the violets. And and there, there's 18 quotes about violets in Shakespeare. So there's all kinds of stuff to memorize, short little bits to sharpen your brain and, and bring violets to mind, and maybe your father. Anyway, moving on to midsummer, Hannah told me that there are some herbs associated with midsummer. Midsummer Night's Dream has the most plants mentioned of any of the plays in Shakespeare. So that says a lot. They're out in the forest, they're talking about all kinds of plants, they're running into them, hiding under them, squeezing in them into people's eyes to make love potions out of them. That's the pansy. So um, lots and lots of plants in Midsummer. But the three that we're going to talk about today aren't necessarily in the play, but Hannah suggested chamomile, which has one quote in Shakespeare, and it's just wonderful. Lavender, which we'll be talking about again in our sleep episode, but the quote is just hot lavender from uh, Perdita in Winter's Tale. And the reason they think that he says hot lavender is because it grows in high heat. The, the southern fields of Provence in France are known for their lavender fields. And, oh, marigold. Marigold is the third one. Marigold is also known as calendula, which Shakespeare does not mention, but there's lots of quotes around marigold. So Hannah, can you tell us why these, why these herbs are associated, why these plants are associated with midsummer and what they do? Yeah, sure. So um, all three are, are really associated with midsummer because this is the time when they are, they're at their best, they're at the most blooming. So if you grow lavender now, then that it's going to be in, in its height of flower, really. And the same with chamomile, too. Um, calendula is a little bit different on, on that side because the word calendula um, derives from the same root as calendar. So it, it actually can grow all year round. Um, but because it's listed in the old astrological way of looking at um, herbs according planetary influence. So calendula was seen as a herb of the sun. And so it's, it's always had this association with midsummer and it will, it will always happily bloom. So with the, with the calendula itself, it's the, the, it's the pot marigold rather than the African marigold. So that really lovely kind of ray of gorgeous beautiful orange flowers that you see and it's the whole flower heads that are used or sometimes just the oop, and when you dry the petals they turn out this really gorgeous orange color and they're quite quite brittle 
Um, they smell quite bitter, and they, they certainly are bitter. Um, but they, they, they're, they're, they're kind of a, a warm, a warming herb, as you would expect, maybe from a, a herb of the sun. But they, they're all to do with taking down inflammation and taking down heat. So internally, when we use them in the tea, they're really great for soothing the digestion. And if you use them in, if you make a tea and then apply that to the skin, it's really very school, very uh, cooling for skin rushes and very healing for the skin too. So that's the marigold. Do you want me to say a little bit about um, a little bit about chamomile? Yes, hang on, hang on. I want to just give a, a quote from marigold because um, the thing about marigold that that Shakespeare talks about is that uh, it opens with the sun and goes to sleep with the sun. So that's kind of a fun thing. And also uh, in um, in Cymbeline, he calls it the merry bud. And also, I think two noble kinsmen, the merry bud. And um, Perdita also in Winter's Tale, which is the second, the second highest number of plants are in the Winter's Tale. So I always think it's kind of funny that the two plays that have the most plants are Midsummer Night's Dream and Winter's Tale, the, the two opposite extreme seasons. And in the section where she's talking about it, she says it's a midsummer, it's a flower of midsummer. So, and that the marigold that goes to bed with the sun and with him rises weeping, that's dew, these are flowers of middle summer. The other thing I just want to mention is midsummer comes not in the middle of the summer. And we always think of the middle of the summer as kind of somewhere in, you know, the third week of July when it's extre extremely hot. But now extremely hot is moving around the planet is at different times. And so, um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess midsummer could be any time at this point, and certainly if we're talking about Australia. Um, so that's the line for marigold: the marigold that goes to bed with the sun, and with him rises weeping. These are the flowers of middle summer. And Hannah's just told us about um, some of their healing properties. So yes, let's talk about chamomile. The one I love about chamomile, Falstaff says that it grows stronger when you trod on it. And the thing I love about that is chamomile is used as a tea, which I'm sure Hannah will address, and it is edible, I think. And um, there's a great quote by Eleanor Roosevelt that says, you don't know how, a woman is like a tea bag. You don't know how strong she is until you put her in hot water. And that always reminds me of the chamomile thing about how it gets stronger when you trod on it. So, so does it help you, make you stronger in some way, Hannah? never heard that quote before that's fantastic that's that's really great um i, I think as a as a herb of resilience yes i think it does make you stronger in a strange way because it's again it, it's another um historically seen as a herb of the sun um and it's a very again it's another warming herb but it's also a drying herb so it can it can kind of astringe and make things a bit tougher and and yeah you are right it's it's and particularly when you tread on calendula sorry tread on chamomile sorry and you release that that fantastic smell um yeah that that's really something quite quite special but it's i think it's in terms of its strengthening perspective it's it really comes from its benefits for the nervous system so it it helps to calm and soothe our nervous systems and help us to just to take down that level of tension which i think could be argued as as helping us feel a little bit more resilient because if you're calm and composed you're probably going to be able to feel a little bit resilient in terms of maybe things that are thrown at you. And from a digestive perspective too, because chamomile is, is another bitter, but it's an aromatic bitter, um, it's, it also has a calminative action as well, which means that it helps to calm and soothe the digestion. So it's, 
and additionally it's very healing for the digestive tract too so for soothing and healing our digestion and giving it a little bit more a little bit more robustness then yeah absolutely i think it's all about the resilience oh that's so great well i i i said it in our last <laughs> much more technically coherent um dress rehearsal that all of these things finding ways to natural ways especially to stay calm stay clear stay sharp stay um sort of mentally toned and and physically it's that thing where oh i wanted to breathe at the beginning of every episode of these just take a big deep breath in uh, as hannah said if you trot on the chamomile it, it will open up the scent and did we talk about lavender at all because i'm just going to say a little not very nice but very helpful thing about lavender i've just learned yesterday i live in new york city um new york city is famous for its little its little roaches and i i have never had them but recently they did some construction and all of a sudden i have been um plagued with them and it turns out they don't like citrus and they don't like lavender so i bought a bunch of lavender spray oh. i've been oh. madly spraying the kitchen with lavender so that's one very practical useful um use if you happen to have that particular problem and what else what else can we aside from putting our laundry on it <laughs> well i mean lavender i mean i think i think most of us have kind of come across its sort of gorgeous little purple flowers um it's it's always been classically seen as a very sleepy herb a very a very calming sedating herb and that's absolutely what it's renowned for and what it's very very, very um but it's a can be a little bit of a tricky customer because because it is so very powerful for some people it can actually have the opposite effect and for, for some people um, you, um it they actually find it more stimulating rather than sort of calming um oh, really? hmm. effect that, that it would normally like have and equally that matter? goes in line with the fact that lavender is one of those herbs that can so it's one to 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 treat because it has these really wonderful calming actions um but for some people it's it's too much so it's a really interesting one from a from a calming mm. you know. and and i'm sorry you may have said why is why are these why is it connected with midsummer or the solstice in particular because it is, um, it's another one of the, the the really sort of wonderful blooming herbs that is at its peak of flowering in midsummer. So it will always at this time of year. This is the time to to really see and smell the best in lavender, and it's also one of the one of the best times to harvest. Oh, well, that's good. Um, and we just put up some planting information about lavender too, if you wanna attempt to grow your own, if you have a little plot of land or a container pot. Um, so this has gone a little longer than we normally, I normally plan for Shakespeare therapy, but I hope it's been helpful and hopefully help you um, get a little barred brain body boost during your week and into the future as we all, as we all stay sharp stay cool stay calm stay focused in a very gentle breathing kind of way and um we will be here next week hopefully with vastly improved technology to to impart a quick and clean little brain body boost for you so thank you very much thank you hannah so much for for bearing with us you know we're 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 not only crossing time but we're crossing vast expanse of water and um and uh morning in new york well actually just gone morning and late afternoon in england and wherever else you happen to be so thanks for tuning in 
watch again with the augmented version, and we'll be back next week. Thank you.